One of the things that biblical scholars and really scholars who do translation for a living, uh, do Bible interpretation, uh, linguists, those sorts of people, one of the things that we run into a lot uh, with non-specialists especially, uh, people who want to be doing research in books like the Bible uh, and are very well-meaning and, and frankly we wouldn't want to discourage that, but this issue of exegetical fallacies seems to come up a lot. Uh, an exegetical fallacy is a phrase that is probably not really familiar uh, to you if you're not a specialist, if you're not a biblical scholar, uh, if you don't work in Bible interpretation regularly. But it's a very common phrase for scholars. Uh, everybody knows what an exegetical fallacy is and, and a whole list of the possibilities, different kinds of exegetical fallacies. What I want to do here is show you some of the more common ones and basically make the point uh, again, people might not like to hear this, but it's true. A lot of the research you read on the internet, a lot of the research you'll read in books that is done by non-specialists, people who lack the credentials in biblical language work, uh, in translation skills. Uh, they, they lack the academic backgrounds in these things. A lot of what you read will just be littered and cluttered with exegetical fallacies, and that is the, the the material you're reading, the conclusions that are drawn, what you're getting from that thing you're reading, whether it's a book or a blog or a website, is wrong, uh, because languages just don't work the way that a lot of these researchers try to make them work or want to believe they work. I'm going to illustrate that here. So I have here five of the more common fallacies, the foreign root fallacy, that is the idea that we get the meaning of a particular English word based upon its Latin or Greek root that you can find like in Webster's Dictionary. Then there's the root fallacy, the idea that there, that a, a shared root among several words somehow determines the meaning of those words. Then there's something called the etymological fallacy where supposedly the constituent parts of words when you take them apart and then put them back together, that determines the meaning of the word. Fourth, there's the sound fallacy, and this takes two varieties. The idea that shared sounds between words in the same language means that they have a shared meaning. And the second variety is that shared sounds between words in a different language, between two different languages, or three, or whatever that that somehow allows the meaning of those words, the meaning of the words between the different languages, to be shared, essentially to be mixed and matched, or to dictate uh, meanings in the other languages from one of the different languages. And lastly, there's the totality transfer fallacy. This is the idea that when you have a word, and a word can have any number of meanings, a broad range of meanings, that somehow there's one meaning that unites them, sort of one ring to rule them all, or that you could transfer, you know, s some sort of meaning. You know, you collect all the possible meanings and you sort of get to a base, basic meaning, and then that sort of contributes to our understanding of, of that word wherever it occurs, no matter the context. Now, all of these are fallacies. They're well known to scholars. And if you're doing Bible interpretation using these methods, your interpretation is going to be wrong. It's going to be flawed. Let me give you illustrations of each one. The foreign root fallacy. Again, that's the idea that the meaning of an English word is determined by, in this case, this illustration, a Latin root. Now, why is this a fallacy? Well, one illustration, our word nice, comes from the Latin nescius, which means ignorant. Now it's very obvious that the Latin root meaning does not transfer to the English word nice. And so you can tell very easily from this example that it doesn't matter what the Latin root was. It doesn't matter what that Latin root meant. It has nothing to do with the word that has evolved in English. What determines word meaning always? The golden rule is context. Context is king. 
Context determines meaning. And when I say context, it means a range of things. It can mean the historical background is a factor. That gives us a context. The type of literature, literary genre, is a context. Religious background of the writer is a context. Cultural background is a context. The paragraph preceding and the paragraph following our particular word or passage that we're looking at, that forms a context. Even the, the location of our word and its relationship to other words in the same sentence forms a context. These are the kinds of things that need to inform your understanding of a word's meaning, not an original root from another language. Second one, the root fallacy. Again, this is the idea that shared roots determine meaning. Really? Again, this is easy to illustrate as a fallacy. In Greek, the word timao means to honor. There's another word in Greek, epitimao, which means to rebuke. Now, those two terms very obviously share a root, T-I-M, tim. Now, this fallacy, if we were to employ it, would have Jesus honoring demons, and it would change one of the Ten Commandments to rebuke your parents instead of honor your parents. Look at the illustration. Matthew 19, 19, we have timao, your father and mother. Honor your father and mother. And in Mark 1, 25 and 26, Jesus is confronting a demon, and we read, But Jesus epitimao him. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit came out of him. Now, if the root sort of united or fused these two, and you could sort of derive a shared meaning, you could interchange them, but you very obviously can't interchange these things here because, like I said, you'd have Jesus honoring demons and you'd be commanded by God to rebuke your parents. They're not interchangeable. And you can, ver you can see from the examples, timao and epitimao, their meanings, you, you, you can't really come up with a common ancestor, so to speak, a common meaning ancestor out of which both honor and rebuke could come. They are mutually exclusive ideas. Okay? So the root fallacy just falls apart here. This is not how meaning is determined. Meaning is determined by context. And again, there's a whole range of contexts. Just remember, context is king. Third one, the etymological fallacy, which is a fun one. This is the idea that constituent parts of words determine meaning. Two illustrations in Greek, anagenosko, okay? There is a verb, anagenosko, two parts, ana, which means up or above, and genosko, which means to know. Now you would think, if we could just take the word apart into its constituent parts, ana and genosko, the meaning, therefore, would be something like to know up or to know above, which doesn't make any sense. Anagenosko, though, actually means to read. Okay, the constituent parts have nothing to contribute to that. Next one, epitimao. We just saw this in the previous fallacy. Epi means on or at or upon, and then timao by itself would be to honor. So you would think if you pulled these apart and looked at their constituent parts, we'd have to honor at or to honor upon. But that isn't what it means. We just saw that it means to rebuke. Again, the constituent parts do not create the meaning. English has a whole host of these. Butterfly. Butter and fly okay, are not going to give you the meaning of butterfly. Butter doesn't fly, and flies are not buttery. Okay? Headship. Okay? Head and ship. Okay, the head, the thing on top of your shoulders, and ship, you know, some big craft that you know, floats in the water, you put those together, they have nothing to do with the meaning of headship, which is leadership. I hope you get the point. But this fallacy is just ubiquitous. It just shows up everywhere in so much material that you read by non-specialists, by amateurs, amateur researchers especially people who are trying to go back into ancient texts in the ancient world, including the Bible, and study it and do research. Their conclusions are often terribly flawed. Next one, the sound fallacy. 
two varieties here again. The first one is that shared sounds between words in the same language create a shared meaning or, or allow a shared meaning. Two English examples here. The words wine and wine. Okay, there, there's no relationship. There's no inherent semantic relationship between the two. And you wouldn't interpret either that way. The same thing for rain, R-A-I-N, and rain, R-E-I-G-N. One is water that falls from the sky, and the other is, is kingship or rulership. There's no relationship between them, even though they sound exactly the same. Second variety here, shared sounds between words in different languages. Do those allow meaning of those words, you know, meanings to be transferred from one language to the other? Does one, one set of sounds in one language inform our understanding of the same set of sounds in another? Again, you'll see this everywhere. Uh, people on, on, on the internet, like William Henry, I think of right away. Does this sort of, th actually William Henry does all of these fallacies and does them frequently. But he, he's especially fond, I guess, of this one, these sort of sound relationships. The fact that I can make a set of sounds in English does not mean that the same set of sounds in Chinese carries the meaning that my English word does, and vice versa. The reverse is true. Examples. In Hebrew, we have Y-A-M, yam, or yam, and in English, we have yam. Okay, we know what in English, in English, a yam is. It's a sweet potato, okay? In Hebrew, yam or yam is a body of water, like a sea or a lake. Hebrew, the next one, bow. This is a verb in Hebrew. It means to go or to come or to arrive, as opposed to the English word bow, the noun, like bow and arrow. Again, there's just no relationship. It doesn't matter that they sound the same. One doesn't inform the other. Last one, the Hebrew word kol, which is a word that means all or every or whole, entire, and English kol, C-O-A-L. Again, obviously no relationship at all. But yet this is done all the time, both by people who want to interpret the Bible and people who want to interpret other ancient texts. Last one, the totality transfer fallacy. This is the attempt to engage in the transfer of all meanings of a word in any given passage and, Im and import that, somehow import all the, all the meanings into any given occurrence of the word anywhere. Or again, to sort of take all the meanings and try to come up with one base meaning and then impose that everywhere else that word occurs. This, this, it just doesn't work this way. Languages do not work this way. Some funny examples. If I said about a friend, he has a fetching wife. Well, I don't mean that she's a dog, and if he threw something, she'd run and go grab it with her mouth and bring it back. Okay, fetching can mean that as a verb, but in this instance, in this context, okay, the word wife tells you what we mean. Again, the context of the words around the word we're interested in. In this context, it means he has an attractive wife, okay? Next one, you need to brand yourself. Well, ouch, you know, that would hurt, wouldn't it, if you took a hot iron and plastered it against your skin and watched it burn a little bit, and burn a, a symbol on yourself. No, that isn't at all what we're talking about. Branding can, in, in business parlance, in business context, again, refers to uh, building a reputation or building notori notoriety, building recognition of either yourself or a product. Lastly, I'm spoiled. Well, does that mean that I need to be taken out and thrown in the trash because we can't eat you anymore? Can you get the idea? Context is everything. We, we wouldn't take a word like spoiled or fetching or brand and make a list like I've done here below with English board. Just try it. We wouldn't list out meanings and then sort of scratch our heads and think, okay, what common base meaning can I contrive? And that's what you're doing. Can I invent? Can I fabricate? That could sort of explain all of these possibilities. And when I get that, 
that must be the fundamental, the base, almost the divine meaning of this word. And that I can therefore take to any place, any verse, if we're doing Bible stuff, and import that meaning into that passage. That's illegitimate. That's a fallacy. Languages do not work this way. English board, I think, you, you, some words just have a multitude of meanings. If this was a noun, it could be a piece of sawed lumber. It could be daily meals, like in the phrase room and board. It could be a council or association. I, I earned a place on the board, okay, the side of a ship, electrical panel, circuit board, a writing surface, like a white board. If it's a verb we're talking about, it could mean to climb on or to seal up, like you board up a window, you know, preparing for a hurricane or something. Or it could be you smash another hockey player okay, into the boards. You check them. Check is an, it would be a word that we could use to illustrate this too. Again, word, languages just don't work this way. It, these are word games that amateur researchers play. And the result, is flawed, misguided, and in some cases harmful interpretation. It just ought not to be. Remember, context is king. And context, again, means all the things I mentioned before. Historical context, worldview, the worldview context of the writer, uh, you know, the, the religious context, the cultural context. What, what made the person think as he or she did? Again, all the things that inform them intellectually, those are all contexts. Then we have literary context. What type of writing? Uh, if I was looking at the word will, W-I-L-L, I would, I would think of it differently if, if I had in my hand a legal document, something that came from a lawyer. Okay, that the type of literature dictates how I'm going to take words that appear in that piece of literature. So literary context is important. Again, all these things, the, the, the way the word relates to other words around it, these are contexts. And context is king in interpretation, not exegetical fallacies and not word games like this.